everyone, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast, the podcast where we talk about things that have made the Scriptures become very real to us because we believe there's a lot of power in the Scriptures, and as they become more real to us, we can draw on that power more uh, intimately to apply them to our lives more. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and this is a short cast. Today, I'm, I'm coming to you from Egypt. We're talking about things that happened in Egypt, and I'm in uh, Giza, right across the street from the Great Pyramids right now, so it seemed like a good time to talk about that. And today we're going to talk about the, the plagues. And um, I believe that the plagues were set up in a way that uh, God set them up in a way that would symbolically speak to not only the Israel, but people all over the ancient Near East. Uh, we've said a number of times that God uh, speaks to people in the language they're expecting. And since these people expected symbolic action, he used that. So I think he spoke uh, it, using symbolic action by setting up uh, kind of a showdown, really, that would teach things to them. Uh, and I think that the plagues are really uh, set as a divine conflict, a contest between Jehovah and Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who is thought of as being semi-divine and representing the gods of Egypt. But this is a contest between Jehovah and Pharaoh. So, for example, um, the Lord says specifically, I will get glory through Pharaoh. Or a uh, later, little later, he says, see what I will do to Pharaoh. Or in the Song of the Sea, which is the, the great uh, song that is in Exodus 19, uh, or sorry, Exodus 15, he twice talks about how he has done this to Pharaoh. He's cast Pharaoh into the sea, or he's cast Pharaoh and his chariots into the sea. So he's, he's very specific about setting this up as a contest with Pharaoh. And in Exodus 9, verse 16, he says it this way, and in very deed for this cause have I raised thee, meaning Pharaoh, so for this cause have I raised you up, Pharaoh, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So he says he's actually raised Pharaoh up as king and as this glorious king for the very purpose that he can then show who is really powerful and who is really God. And so I think that the stage is set for this to be a divine conflict between the Pharaoh and uh, Jehovah. Now, uh, many people have tried to approach this, and I've done it myself, where you go and you look at each plague, so the plague of frogs and the plague of uh, the, the water turning to blood and so on, and you see if you can turn this into, uh, uh, you look if there's a specific thing Pharaoh's supposed to do for the river or about frogs or something like that. And it turns out for almost all of them, you can find that. Pharaoh is in charge of something about uh, what we're seeing there, about making the crops grow and about the herds reproducing well and so on. The only two that we struggle with are the, the lice and the flies, and we actually aren't even sure if that's how to translate it. That, it's a little tricky for us. We don't know exactly how to translate those two. Um, and so maybe if we could translate it better, we could tie those in. But the rest you can tie into a specific aspect of Pharaoh, uh, but in some ways, as I looked at that once, I thought, well, that's almost methodologically meaningless. Uh, Pharaoh seems like he's in charge of everything. So it doesn't matter that you can tie it into Pharaoh. What couldn't you tie into Pharaoh? And then I realized that that is actually the point. And this speaks to a larger issue in Egyptian religious thought. So we need to do a quick issue or a quick uh, lesson on Egyptian religion, which is what I'm sure you were uh, hoping for. But uh, if we're going to talk about the kind of the core or central tenet of Egyptian religion, it is really the idea of ma'at. And ma'at is the correct order. It's, it's things being the way they should. It's social order. It's cosmic order. It's uh, geological order. It's the correct order in every way. Uh, everything that you might uh, do with uh, in any aspect of creation if it's going to be the right way, the way things should be, then it was in Ma'at. So the idea is that when the world was created, it was not created out of nothing. And I'm not going to go into this in detail because I have a podcast on this. If you want to go back to the creation and look at uh, my shortcast on uh, creation and creative waters and chaos. But just to, to quickly uh, summarize this. Uh, the, uh, the idea is that creation didn't come out of nothing. It came out of unorganized material or unorganized matter, which is symbolized by water. And uh, then when creation happens, it's the organization of dry land 
in the midst of the water. And that symbolizes the beginning of creation. And for the Egyptians, that also the idea was that everything the sun encircled was that which was the firmament or the dry land or the created uh, area and, and uh, the uncreated area was water or watery chaos. When it was created, everything was in a perfect, pristine or Edenic state. You could say it was in the state of Ma'at. That's how they said it. It was everything was exactly how it should be. The problem is that at some point Ma'at was disturbed and Isfet or chaos was introduced. So to be clear about how this, this works, there are different stories in Egyptian religious thought as to how this happened. One of them is that mankind rebelled against God by being too loud or in some other way, mankind rebelled against God and that disturbed the right order and introduced chaos. Another version of how chaos is introduced is that uh, everything is going great as Osiris is the king, but his brother Seth is jealous, so Seth kills Osiris, and then Osiris has to be rescued, and we'll talk more about that later, but uh, that's a, an introduction of chaos or Isfet and the disruption of Ma. So we, after this, Egyptian religious thought really focuses on and, and circles around the idea that uh, chaos is always trying to overcome Ma, or chaos is trying to overcome order, and in order for us to survive in any way, you have to have Maat continually being put in the place of, of Isfet or chaos. Maat has to be restored. You have to get back to that perfect, wonderful, pristine state or else entropy or, or complete chaos will overcome creation. So the king really has two primary jobs. One is to destroy chaos. Uh, and you do that, it's called Isfet, you destroy chaos, and you can see images of the king offering, say, a wedged eye that will spit, or a Uraeus, that spits out and destroys chaos. Or one of the prototypical ways we see the king uh, destroying chaos is by destroying foreigners. Foreigners kind of become uh, Isfet or chaos incarnate, and so as the king smites or kills or destroys or conquers foreigners, that's seen as a way that he destroys chaos. So you destroy chaos, and you replace it with Ma'at. So then the other primary duty of the king is to offer Ma'at to the gods. He gives them order uh, as an offering. He makes things the way they should be. And so this is what the king is supposed to do. Get rid of chaos and uphold Ma'at. So I would say, knowing that, we should also then understand that the plagues represent every element of the Egyptian world transformed into chaotic form. Whether that's the water, the frogs, the lice and the flies, the weather, the sun, the crops, the herds, everything goes chaotic. We could say all hell breaks, breaks loose, but that is something that's not supposed to happen. The king's supposed to make sure it stays in order, and instead it goes completely chaotic. And so the king is failing. And in fact, what happens is when chaos breaks loose, the king wants to control it, but he can't. And instead, he has to each time go to Moses and ask Moses to supplement or to, uh, to supplicate God. And God then ends the chaos and brings the order. And so time and again, Pharaoh fails in getting rid of chaos and restoring order, and God succeeds time and time and time again. Now, that's really powerful and powerfully uh, speaking, but it it's, uh, becomes even more powerful with a couple of the the plagues in specific ways. Because again, as we think about this uh, religious thought of the need to get rid of uh, chaos and restore order, for the Egyptians, that is really symbolized most of the time in some kind of rebirth, whether that be um, the, the sun going down at night and being born again. Well, let's just look at some of, some of the uh, cycle of rebirth that is affected by the plague. One of the great symbols of rebirth is that every year the Nile floods and that watery chaos covers the land, but then as it starts to recede, the dry land appears. And so you have chaos being uh, conquered and dry land or creation or Ma'at taking its place. But in this case, the Nile itself is turned to blood and that it's no longer going to be that rebirth cycle if it floods. Um, the idea of herds and crops uh, reproducing is part of that cycle of rebirth that is so important. One of the most important symbols for rebirth and the recreation or restoration of Ma'at is the journey of the sun. 
It's thought that the sun uh, dies every night at, at uh, dusk or at sunset. The sun dies every night and it goes on this dangerous journey throughout the night and then is born again in the morning. And that is probably the, the cycle of rebirth par excellence that uh, means that chaos is destroyed and you uphold um, order. So um, another really key one is the the death of the firstborn. So in Egyptian religious thought, remember that one of the ways caste is introduced is by Osiris being killed by his brother Seth. And Osiris would cease to exist except for his wife Isis. And then with the help of her son, who it's interesting because uh, her son is able to be born because of this, but somehow he is already, even before he's born, he's already existing and able to do this. Anyway, um, Horus and Isis save Seth's afterlife. Uh, so they don't save his life, but they save his afterlife so that he can continue to exist. And as a result, we have the, uh, the restoration of order as Horus becomes the king in place of his father. But when you're first, and, and that's uh, something that's important for both the royalty and everyone else, when they die, their child, is supposed to, especially the firstborn, is supposed to provide them the correct kind of burial, provide them offerings, and so on. And this allows them to continue to live. If your first, if all the firstborns die, that cycle of rebirth and and hope for uh, life is interrupted. It's it's a terrible tragedy, and so we see that um, that really the uh, the plagues are particularly striking this idea of mod being a rebirth is the restoration of mod and as it uh, affects these cycles of rebirth in the Nile and the herds and the crops and the sun right so the herds die the crops die especially from the hail um, the sun is darkened and the firstborn die and uh, the, the Passover and the angel of death story all of those really strike at this idea of putting mod in its place now if we want to understand in particular uh, a couple of these, let's look at the idea of the journey of the sun. Uh, as I said, the, the idea is that the sun dies every night and it's born again in the morning, but that the fact that the sun does come to back to life every morning is the great, great symbol of the fact that rebirth keeps happening, Ma keeps being put in its place. Uh, but on this dangerous journey, the, uh, at night, there is a chaos monster that is trying to overcome the sun and stop it on its journey and thus destroy uh, Maat and have chaos triumph. And that uh, chaos monster is a snake. It's a giant snake named Apophis or Pep. Uh, and Apophis is, is pictured as a snake, but as the sun goes on its journey, it's also protected by a snake or by snakes. Uh, and so you'll find all sorts of depictions of snakes depicting or protecting the sun and spitting fire out and, and different things. There are other animals, there's a cat that will help and some men, people and so on, but really one of the primary symbols is a snake. Now, we usually don't think of the, uh, the staff being turned into a snake as one of the plagues, and it's not a plague, but it's part of this contest. It's the beginning of the contest in many ways. And uh, it's, it's interesting because in, uh, when Moses is told uh, to do this on Mount Sinai, he puts his staff down and it becomes a, um, a snake. And that's this great chaos monster, right? But then it's, uh, when he actually does it with Pharaoh, the word in King James is still translated as a snake, but the word is crocodile. But either way, it's still a chaos monster, all right? Uh, and we'll talk about it as a snake because that's uh, how it originally is depicted as happening. So Moses puts his staff down and it becomes a snake or a chaos monster. And everyone re will recognize that this is a chaos monster. But what do Pharaoh's uh, priests do? Well, they put down their rods and they become snakes that will protect, right? But in this case, they fail. And Moses's chaos snake eats the snakes of Pharaoh. They would have seen this loud and clear as a sign that Chaos is winning, that, that Pharaoh cannot conquer chaos and put Ma in its place. Only God seems to be able to do that. Uh, and then, as we said, this, this great tragedy with the arrow of the angel of death, where Pharaoh's own Horus is struck down 
and every Egyptian's Horus is struck down. These are, these are just huge blows against that. And so Pharaoh eventually capitulates and lets the Israelites go, but he always has one last kind of bow in his quiver, as it were, one last thing he can do, and that is to ride off and destroy foreigners. That is the way that Pharaoh can show that he's destroying chaos and putting moth in its place. And so he lets the Israelites go, and then he rides off after them. And if he can catch up to them and destroy them, then he's destroyed chaos and it will be understood he's put Ma in its place. And the king has finally triumphed, not Jehovah or Moses. So what happens? Well, Pharaoh rides out, and just as he's ready to destroy the Israelites or these chaotic foreigners, instead of his Uraeus or his snake spitting fire at chaos, instead, God spits fire at them. And suddenly, Pharaoh is being portrayed as the chaotic element, and God as the one who spits fire and ends that chaos. And just to make sure we understand this, the next thing that happens while God is spitting fire out at chaotic Pharaoh, he then parts the Red Sea. And think in terms of removing the chaotic water and creating dry land. And this means that God is creating and restoring order as he spits fire at chaos, which is Pharaoh and his host. That there could not be any more clear symbol. And so Israel, the Israelites go through on dry land in this ordered Ma'at created place that God has created. And then when God is done with that and he stops spitting fire at Pharaoh, Pharaoh goes onto that dry land and instead the watery chaos topples in and destroys his host, making it clear that chaos has triumphed when it comes to Pharaoh's life, but order has triumphed for the Israelites. And all of this really demonstrates that Jehovah really is king, not Pharaoh, not his gods. It is Jehovah who is king. And that message is received loud and clear. Uh, and when we see that, even when the Israelites get into the promised land and say to the people of Jericho and other places, they say, well, we heard what your God did to the Egyptians. Right? This message has been sent loud and clear in symbolic action that, that Jehovah is king. And I think we would do well. This, this is uh, something that, that has made it really real to me as I see how much God is working with the Israelites in, and the people around them in the, the language they expect. That makes it become very, very real for me. And then I have to ask myself, so how do I learn this lesson in a real way? And I think there are a number of ways we should all think about what do we do because we understand Jehovah is king. What should that mean in your life? How should that let God prevail in your life? How is it then that you're going to listen to God and not to the world? Uh, the world is like Pharaoh. And if we're going to listen to the world's thinking, then we're just asking ourselves to let chaos triumph in our lives. But if we will let God prevail in our lives and listen to his way of thinking more than anything else, then we will really understand that Jehovah is king and we will be ruled by him and saved and protected by him. It is my hope that this can happen for all of us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.